All right, we have ourselves an exam coming up today. And we have really only two topics. And I say two topics here. The two topics would be dealing with Newton's second law and dealing with work and how potential energy relates to work. So first, you should be able to calculate the work from the potential energy, or excuse me, the work from the force. And if you calculate the work, you calculate the potential energy. I'm just putting back your stand next to you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, except for I'm using the wrong thing, so I can't advance with this. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so you should be able to calculate the work. And if you can calculate the work, you calculate the change in potential energy because potential energy is defined as the, or defined by the work. And you need to be able to calculate the force from a potential energy function, which is just the reverse process. So, of course, you will have those equations on the test. You have that gradient. Don't forget the minus sign, by the way, minus sign here, minus sign here. The same minus sign since they're fundamentally the same equation, just one in differential form, one in integral form. So the gradient, I have it written here in two forms. First in Cartesian coordinates where I use x for the x half for the x direction, y half for the y direction. So on. And then in the spherical coordinates, the, the sadly more complicated spherical coordinates. What? All right. Now, doing some practice. Suppose we have this potential energy. Now, let me ask you a really silly question. It's a really silly question because if you know the answer, you know it's so, silly. Is this potential energy based on a conservative force? Based off of the conservative force. Yeah. Yeah. Well, gravity is conservative. Right? Well, that's not gravity. No, that's not. Well, spring is conservative, so yeah. It's not a spring. I intentionally chose something we haven't seen. Kx. By virtue of it being a potential energy, it has to be associated with conservative force. Potential energies only occur if you have a conservative force. If it's a non-conservative force, there is no potential energy. So part of the reason that we can do our energy analysis and not know the forces is because, well, force is what causes the potential energy to begin with. So that answer, every potential energy is associated with a conservative force. How do I find that conservative force from this equation? Could you use that stupid table doing anything with zeros and canceling out and crap? Actually, sure, you betcha. No, we don't. Oh, we don't. That, that, that's how you determine if a force is conservative. Well, we, know this is conservative. we know this is conservative because we have the potential energy. But what we have is the force vector is equal to minus the gradient vector of potential energy. And so all we have to do is, with this I can slide up so we can see what that gradient is. And we're going to have this is equal to minus r hat d d r of k q one q two over r plus theta hat times one over r d d theta. And remember, you can't combine the r with the d theta there. It's two separate things of the same thing. Whoops, I put a plus sign here. Let me just put a, a bracket outside so I can put plus signs inside. Plus V hat times 1 over R sine theta d d phi of k q1 q2 over R. Oops, I put over R squared because, because I was thinking incorrect correctly. So that's the calculation for finding the force. Now that looks like it's going to be rough, but it's not. Why is that not rough? Because a lot of it's going to cancel out. If I cancel out 
what you mean is be zero yeah. because there is no theta dependence on that potential energy. Hence, partial with respect to theta. Remember, partial means anything that's not the variable is a constant. So the partial of kq1, q2 over r with respect to theta is zero because there's no theta in there. Likewise, there's no phi in there. So the partial with respect to phi is zero. And all we have left is this first one. So minus r hat times the constant. Let's just put the constant out first. That's a Q. So I just need the partial with respect to R of 1 over R. Now, partial is a normal derivative. It's just we take treat everything that's not that variable as a constant. So we just, the normal derivative of 1 over R. What's the normal derivative oh, of 1 over R? That's the integral. Oh. Oh. Oh, the derivative of 1 over R? That's r to the minus one, so your rule is you push it's one. Is bring down, down the power. Two, so you bring down the minus one. R squared. So it's negative one. One over r squared. And then it's going to be right minus one over r squared. Bring down the minus one, and then lower the exponent from minus one to minus two. So that's equal to minus r hat k q one q two, and then the derivative was minus 1 over r squared, as Randy said. Minus and a minus makes it a plus. And there's the force associated with that potential energy. Is that DDR that you have kind of squirrely doohickey things over there in the orange? What, what about so it? So you have r hat, r hat k q1 q2 and then something. Is that DDR? This here? The part outside the one over all, but yes. But yeah, the, yes, the this this right here. Yeah. yeah, that's the partial derivative with respect to R. Okay, so that is DDR. And so the, the reason I did that, this here is what I wrote in blue. Yeah, no, I get yeah, that, okay. but that looks like a backwards six. Is that a D? That is what the D looks like, yes. It looks like a backwards six or a partial derivative. This is partial derivative. Yeah, so, the, yeah, you're, you're the one who hasn't had these in any recent time frame, if ever. I haven't either. No. But Randy, you're a Diffie Q, aren't you? No, you're not. Count two. Right? Count two. We're learning about partial. Okay. okay. Well, just remember with partials, they're the easy derivative. The symbol for the partial is that. I thought this was a calculus. Calculus should have been no, no, they've, they've had calculus. <clears throat> the important thing to remember that last word is constant, not constat. <clears throat> the important thing to read, remember about partial derivatives is they are easier because a partial derivative is a normal derivative except you're treating anything that's not the variable you're taking derivative with respect to as constant. So if I have a function of x, y, and z and I'm taking a partial with respect to x, y and z are, are just constants. Don't have to do any chain rule action. So it's, it's an easier type of derivative. So just do it like you would any other derivative. You do have to know this backward six, as Randy called it, or Randy, excuse me, David called it, means partial derivative. So why don't we take the partial derivative of the r hat? Um, well, because it was r hat partial derivative of the function. There was no r hat in my potential energy function. Okay. Otherwise, that would have been a good question. I mean, yeah. Would have been when I have, have to come up with an answer. So, is this associated with conservative force? Yes. If so, was conservative force? We found it. Do you have a question on how we found it? Well, how we went from this to putting it into this equation to substituting the gradient. All of this stuff is substituting the gradient and then doing the derivative.
any step along the way that, that's confusing you. Will we have those equations on the test? You will have the equation shown on this page here. Well, you won't have it blown up like this. So you won't have the boxed in part, but you'll have everything else that's on this. Including the upside down delta. Yes, yes, yes. On all of that. I do not expect you to have those memorized. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that I can deal. Um, what's is that just the expanded integral of force times? Yes, that, that's just saying the force is going to have its x components, y component, and z component. Okay. And dx is dx and the x half, the third, the dx vector is dx and the x direction plus dy and the y direction plus dz. So that's just expanding. So it means exactly what it shows before. It's just expanding what that vector is and what, I guess I call it DR. Randy, you said something that could be here. So I'm reading negative potential energy is equal to work from A to B. Yes. It's equal to the interval uh, A to B multiplied by force times DR, which is. D DR is the, is the um, distance that's traveled with this path. Right, so it could be in the x direction, y direction, z direction, or some variation of it. And in fact, because it's a conservative force, force, not force, because it's a conservative force, the path doesn't matter. So you can choose whatever path you want between A and B to do the integral. Obviously, you choose the easy one. If you have something that the force is only in the x direction, you go from here to here, go like this and like this. Because only this has a value that's not zero. This one has a value that's zero. So it's because it's conservative force, part of being a conservative force, remember that curl being zero, means that the path doesn't matter in the, the right you take. Okay, let's look at another problem. Suppose we have a force described by this function. Is this conservative? Okay, stop doing that. Is this conservative? No. Okay. You you answered quickly. I I can look at things and I can answer with you now that I've looked at it, but I have to look at it to do some analysis. What was your reason? Because the z hat and the y with the c. Right. Because now it's not necessarily if you can have something complicated that well, it doesn't have to be that complicated. Okay, but you could have a way of making it so you have a Y in your Z term and still be um, conservative, but it, it has to have more than one variable and gone. So basically, he looked at it and said, it's likely not conservative because my Z component has a variable other than Z. The actual way to tell, because there are ways of doing that, is to actually do the gradient. Now, if we had had so the opposite side of the coin that Dave used in his analysis. If the x component was only a function of x, the y component was only a function of y, and the z component was only a function of z, we know immediately it's conservative. That seems to be the y. That's, that's why we, we have to go through and do the check. So now we do the check. We check the curl, as it's called, del cross f. So this was in Cartesian coordinates, and this is what Dave was referring to as we do that matrix thing. Because when you do a cross product, and I believe Randy and Oksana have done more of these than they, oh, no, not Oksana, she's not in statics. Oh, you are? Are you both statics and circuits? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So you've both done more of these recently than you like. So doing this cross product, and by the way, we're just reviewing today in case I didn't make that clear at the outset. <laughs> Nothing new here. So, because here I use X hat, Y hat, and Z hat. Now, I'm not telling you which type of problem we have from this set, but it has vectors, and I use I hat, J hat, K hat, my vectors on the test. So I'm going to follow the suit that I have here, X hat, Y hat, Z hat. That is just part of how a cross product works. Then I put the vector that is first in the cross product. Now, cross products, as we talked about with torque, we did the right hand rule, right? The right-hand rule in this will give you the same answer, but this one here lends itself more to mathematics and to more complicated situations. Whereas what we've been doing in general physics is 
not so complicated and easier. Oh, and easier, I guess it's kind of redundant now, isn't it? So now I put in the gradient, the X component of the gradient was, what do those backwards sixes mean? Partials. So those come from this equation that you will be given on the test. Right there is what I have in the red. And then I just have to put my vector in. So my vector was ax squared in the x direction minus b over y in the y direction and cy in the z direction. And then I do my work. And if I get something that's not zero, I can stop there. I don't have to go to the brutal end. If I get something that's not zero, I'm done. So this is equal to, and we choose this as our starting point. We take the first one, x hat, and multiply it by the determinant of its co-matrix, which is the remaining rows and columns that x is not part of. So then minus y hat, minus because you just alternate sign with each one as you go across, y hat times the determinant of its co-matrix, which is the first column and the last column. Alternate sign, so it's going to go plus z hat, determinant of its co-matrix, Whoops. So there I have expanded how we do the cross product. And <clears throat> I know you've learned different ways. If you have a three by three matrix only, which is all we have, then you can do an alternate, add a couple more columns and do plus everything going down to the right and minus everything going down to the left. But it only works if you have a three by three to do it that way. So now if I do this, I'm going to have X hat times the derivative with respect to y of cy, um, well, derivative with respect to y of cy is going to be c. Oh. Yeah. And then I have minus the derivative with respect to z of by minus by, b over y, excuse me, that's zero. That's not equal to zero. I can stop right here. I don't have to do, and it turns out the rest of them are zeros. I didn't have to do the rest of the calculations because I already had one that was not zero. If this is not zero, what does that mean? Not conservative. Not conservative. So I've got a big fat no, it's not conservative. Randy. Part where you put the partial derivative of dy, partial derivative of dz, mm -hmm. and then below that, but negative d of y, c y, maybe or something like that. What are you looking at for that? Okay, so you're talking about how I determine the stuff that's in this smaller determinant here? Yes. Okay, so what you do is the first term was x, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to cross out the other terms in the same row and column as x. And so I have the determinant of what remains. That's called its co-matrix. Now, if I go to the next one, if I'm doing y, so the second one here, remember you alternate the sign every time, so that's why there's a minus sign there. And then I cross out its row and column, and what's left is these two and these two, so that's what I have in that determinant. Yeah. Got it? And then you alternate the sign so it's positive. Yeah, you alternate the sign so it's positive. That's right. Yeah. Wow. 
Okay, so we determined this is not conservative. We can't go on to find a potential energy function. If you get a problem like this in the test and you turn it's not conservative, you don't go on because you're just doing math for the sake of math because it's not for the sake of physics anymore because it doesn't correspond to anything real. So we won't go on and find a potential energy because it doesn't exist. So here's another one. Using David's rule of thumb, what can you say? Not just probably, it must be. It must be because the X component is only a function of X, the Y component is only a function of Y. Right, the, it was the reverse that was probably, or maybe. But if it's like this, it must be conservative. So this one here, I can say because the X component function X, Y component function Y, Z component function Z doesn't exist. Then it must be conservative, you know, the curl is zero. I, I don't have to do the math because I, I have enough knowledge to know that. If you don't have enough knowledge to know that, you can do the curl. No one's going to mark you wrong for doing the curl. Um, sure, sure, I can do the curl. Yeah, yeah. Well, why don't you tell me what to do? Oh, okay. Uh, so you put that upside down triangle. Yeah, yeah, you close that. You figure x, y. You don't have any z. Well, you still have to put the z. Otherwise, you can't do a determinant. Determinant has to be a square matrix. Okay, then what? Um, the part of the is the x, the little dot, x is the same thing with this y, the same thing with z. And you put the variables in the last one, the two x squared, the two x squared, and then the other one is the y squared, the y squared, the y squared, and then there's nothing in zero, so you do this next time. Okay. Perfect. Well, x hat times. Yep. <laughs> Whoops. All right, then what? Okay, you, you have to do the top acting on the bottom. So you, so you do the partial of, right? The, the order is important here because if you did the other way, you'd be taking a derivative of nothing. So, so you have DDZ. Oops, that's a X. Right, you can't put the 4Y cubed first. I have to put the DDZ first. And, and that's, that's because of where it's located. The second row comes before the third row when you're doing the determinant, okay? this point when you say same thing I take it you know exactly what you're doing okay now the last step is evaluating those derivatives 
which because this is a fairly new topic to you, you've only had it when we talked about it in class here before. What's the partial of zero with respect to y? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that didn't take a lot of thinking. What's the partial of 4y cubed with respect to z? The, the key, David's right. The key is because we're taking a partial with respect to z, and that's a y. Since it's not a z, it's a constant. That's the rule for partials. Now, if it was ZY, then we would have... Right. If it was ZY, then we would have Y left over. Yeah. So, because it's a partial... Uh, different color. Well, who can tell? Because it's a partial with respect to Z of 4Y cubed, Y is not Z, hence it's partial of a constant. Okay, what do we get for the y hat terms then? Because x is not z. Now you see the partials are easier, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then finally plus z hat. And that's again x, y, 0. y, x, 0. It was when we had something like this here, d, d, y of c, y, then we had the variable of the der derivative in the function. And so then we had a, a derivative that wasn't zero. That not Correct. That does not equal zero. And that's where David's rule of thumb comes in. This one here, we couldn't be certain, but we suspected it wasn't conservative because the z component had something that wasn't z. This one here, the X component has only X. The Y component has only Y. It has to be conservative. Because you're going to have all of them are like we had here. We have a partial of something that's a function of a different variable. Okay, so now that we've established it's conservative, then we can go on to the next step and find the potential energy that's associated with it. This is, believe it or not, my last slide, so I could just go down below. I'm all proud of myself because I'm going to finish early. I mean, this isn't trivial stuff, so finishing early. What color is it going to write? Well, it should be blue. Oh, it should be. <laughs> I think it should be blue. <laughs> now, still blue. Okay. Okay, it only shows green now. Still blue. As soon as I write, it changes back. <laughs> Let's just call it a bug and move on. So how do we find the potential energy now that we have established that it's conservative and thus it does have an associated potential energy? Opposite. It was the derivative to find the force from the potential energy. It has a dot product in it. Change in potential, yes. Change in potential energy. What does three, three lines mean? Okay, congruent to or defined as. Depends on, I think, context, wow. but yeah. I'm thinking, yeah. Dr. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, change of potential energy is defined as minus the work. Remember from the first slide, the equations you're going to have equals minus the integral from, and I had on the first slide, AB, A to B of the force. Dot by dr, that's right. Dotted, not multiplied. Dot, when you have vectors, you can't multiply vectors. But you can do a dot product, which is multiplying the parallel parts, or a cross product, which is multiplying the perpendicular parts. Right, so normally x means times, and dot means times. But if I have vectors, they mean different things. And I, I think... I don't know. I don't know the history of math, but I think that it comes from, you know, we have this dot product and this cross product. We're like, well, if it's not a vector, that you're just multiplying. I, that's what I guess is why they both mean the same thing. So, what is my dr? Hmm. What did I say about the path? Choose the path that is easiest. And so we're just going to say, okay, 
we're going to go from zero to X final in the X direction, and then zero to Y final in the Y direction, and be done with it, right? So you can actually write this out more explicitly as minus integral from A to B of this force, 2X cubed, X hat plus 4Y cubed, Y hat dot X hat DX plus Y hat DY plus Z hat DZ. Now, when you write it out this way, when you do a dot product, just backing up one minute, what does it mean when you do a dot product? Multiplying the parallel parts. So X and X, right? So there's the X and X. And then I'll do Y and Y. Where did your X hat go? When you multiply, when you do the dot product, it disappears. Okay. We call it a scalar product because you don't have a vector after you do a dot product. Scalar is just a vector. Yep. Whereas a cross product is also called a vector product because as we saw from before, we got a vector when we did cross product. So that's a good question. So then this is just going to be minus the integral from A to B from Y A to Y B of or Y B to Y. Right. Or Y Q to Y. Right. And then the last one doesn't exist, right? So let me just put minus the integral from Z A to Z B of zero DZ, just to be super explicit on why it disappears, because it was zero times Z hat. Dude, minus zero because don't call me pedantic. Just okay. Yes, I did. Ooh, yes, that I did wrong. The sign was correct. The exponent, not so correct. Because it's the lower limit. Upper limit minus lower limit. So this is the upper minus lower. It's hard to tell there's two P's in my upper. And then likewise, the upper limit minus the lower limit. So that's my change in potential energy. Now I said, what's your potential energy function, not your change in potential energy? And so this is something that I have written up in the lab guide. If you go back and look at it, um, <clears throat> you could have had potential energy. Okay, so you have final minus initial, right? And so you would say, just with a naive reading, uh, my colors, I want to change my colors. There, change my colors. So now I have T 
crap. I, I, I still have to change one more color. Okay, so we have potential energy B minus potential energy A. And I've colored the B terms red, the blue terms, well, the A terms blue. So we would read this generally as potential energy B is equal to minus one-half XB to the fourth minus YB to the fourth. Uh, I think potential energy A is one-half X to the fourth. Plus. Because there's a minus sign right there. So everything gets flipped over here. So you would typically read it like that, and that is usually what we define it as. We usually say, therefore... Those three dots mean therefore PE equals minus one half X to the fourth minus Y to the fourth. That's what we usually do. But there is another option, one that we usually don't do. You already have bounds. Yes, I do. I do. This is not a bound from integration. Because, because my definition of potential energy is the difference between the two. I could have my potential energy B is equal to one half, minus one half X to the fourth, my C to the fourth plus C, and my potential energy A is the same thing. And then when I subtract these two, the C's would cancel out, or not cancel out, subtract out, right? So it's not part of the integral, it's part of the definition. So it's possible that you have plus an additive constant, but virtually every time we say, the additive constant could be any value. Let's choose zero. That's just what you're choosing for your reference point. That's why you can choose for potential energy, gravitation, potential energy. You can choose any elevation as your reference point for y equals zero because that's just changing what this additive constant is. Yeah. But in, in a case like where you have, well, here we have x to the fourth and y to the fourth. It's going to make a difference where your starting point is, what your values are, right? And it's just generally easier to say, you know, at x equals zero, y equals zero, potential energy is zero. And so that's usually what we go with. So that's how we get it. So certainly if this is on the test, you don't have to put this. I'm just being pedantic, showing you exactly how it works. Because it's important to understand why you can choose your reference point arbitrarily. That's everything I had prepared, and I'm 12 minutes early. So what is the actual answer that you do on the test? The thing inside this purple box with or without the plus C. Okay. So questions, anything? Conservative, I don't have to do any more work. Do you? Yes, yes. Gone. That's it's a problem, it's not conservative. <laughs> okay, so on the test, your calculus based problem is going to be one of the calculations I did in class today. Obviously, not with the same function, but it's going to be one of the calculations I did today. So make sure that you can, let's see, the first thing we did was go from potential energy to force. Then the second thing we did was have a force and do the curl to see if it's conservative. And then if it's conservative, do that kind of rule. What was the second one? What was the girl? Is that on the case right here? To check to see if it's conservative force. Okay, but what was that? Um, yeah, this is all one up at the moment. Uh, I had a question about our scrapbook. Yeah. I almost forgot about it, so I kind of replied. I was going to say something in class on Monday and forgot to. Yeah. I actually want you to use this. Uh oh. So, uh oh, but it says it's overdue by like a year and six days, so I was thinking. Oh, do I have? Yes, yeah, so I'm like Nathan. He's the one who's supposed to set all this. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> a year. Um, oh, yeah, here's my main question though. So, you want entries 
adding up, right? So you get five entries from like classes, you have five entries from the ATM, combine them into one to one piece. Um, I, I want you to in your in your document keep them all together. So at the yeah. end of the semester, you have one document with all of them. You're just adding on. Everything. But as you'll see, when I grade them, I'm going to drop everything except for the five. So if you turn in just the five, that would be fine because that's all I'm grading. But I want you to have one document so at the end you can you know, show mom and dad. Hey, here's what we did. Okay. You know, I mean, yeah, I just think we're starting by like colors as well. Like this is chapter four, five, six, seven. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, eat. I love that. I'm going to review the test because 